Militarily Speaking, Episode 16, Command and General Staff College Foundation. This episode, we talk with Colonel Roderick Cox and Laura Morgan. Welcome to Militarily Speaking, brought to you by Armed Forces Bank. This is Tom McLean. And Jody Vickery. Oh, th- yeah, I'll you're introduce the, myself today. You're the co-host today, yes, huh? Yes, yes. All right. Well, welcome to you. pilot Welcome to our show. We're excited to have our audience listening and learning more about the Command and General Staff College Foundation. We might abbreviate that during the podcast to CGSC. I do want to take just a second and introduce our guests today. We've got Colonel Roderick Cox, retired, and Laura Morgan, I'll start with Colonel Cox. He became the third president and CEO of the Command and General Staff College Foundation on December 14th, 2018. He previously served as the program director of the Foundation Simon Center beginning in March 2016. Prior to joining the center and the foundation, Cox was a consultant providing personal career guidance and business management advice, a speaker at civic, philanthropic, and educational organizations on leadership management, and security policy, and a volunteer assisting various organizations that support veterans, school children, and the homeless in the Kansas City metropolitan area. Do you need a break? You good? I'm good. I've That's had plenty lot, of it? coffee. Oh, I mean, there's know. there's more. I know there's, there's more. There's we lots more. Plenty to talk about. Yes. We need a podcast just for his credentials. Cox's <laughs> awards and decorations include the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, the Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal, the NATO Medal, the Joint Meritorious Unit Award, and the Honorable Order of St. Barbara. Cox earned both a Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts degrees from the University of Missouri at Columbia and a Master of Strategic Studies degree from the U.S. Army War College. Among numerous academic and skill courses, he is a resident graduate of the U.S. Army War College, the National Defense University's Armed Forces Staff College, the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, the U.S. Army Combined Arms and Services Staff School. Got this. This is a lot. (laughs) And he is an honor graduate of the U.S. Army Field Artillery Advanced and Basic Officer Courses. That would be near and dear to my husband's heart, who is former field artillery himself. He currently serves on the board of the University of Missouri Military Veterans Alumni Association and as a member of the Bank of America Advisory Panel. We also have with us. Well, let me take this one. Oh, thank you. Laura Morgan. Take a breather. Laura Morgan, are you with us? I am. All right. So, Excellent. Laura, let me introduce Laura Morgan, who's Director of Operations at CGSC Foundation. Laura is responsible for the daily operations of the CGSC Foundation Office and the coordination of foundation events. She is the spouse of an Army officer. She has extensive experience in event planning, coordinating, and office management. You've got some kiddos in high school and college. All right. Well, welcome to you both. We're, we're very happy you've joined us today. <laughs> to kick us off, it would be great for, for those of us in our audience that may not be familiar with CGSC Foundation and the good work you do there, if you could share about the vision of the foundation and how it got started. Well, first off, thank you very much for having us on your podcast. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the work that our foundation does. So, as you mentioned, we abbreviated as the CGSC Foundation. The Command General Staff College Foundation does good things for good people. We're an IRS-designated 509A2 public charity that's incorporated in the state of Kansas back in 2005. We've been granted status as a 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofit educational foundation under the Internal Revenue Code. Our mission is to support the U.S. Army's Command and General Staff College as they develop leaders of character and competence for ethical service to our nation. Our foundation was started to provide resources and support in areas that appropriated funding, that is Army funding, is either not available or is not authorized. And we provide the support in three areas, generally speaking. Scholarship, that is enhancing the academic experience for those that attend the college and the faculty. Outreach, that is connecting Americans with the college and their military. And then the third category we call soldier and family support. That's enriching the lives of our military families. That's great. You guys do really good work there. I know I've experienced some of that firsthand in a previous life, and I know that the school is better for the support that you provide them. Thank you, Rod. Rod, can you dive in a little bit for us and talk about the student enrollment, the composition of that student enrollment, and if there is a process on how the college operates? Sure. The, the Command and General Staff College itself is actually comprised of four schools. The Command and General Staff School, 
the School of Advanced Military Studies, the School of Command Preparation, and the Sergeant's Major Academy. If you'll allow me, I'll break down and just talk a little bit about each one of the four schools. Yeah, do, do so. Great. Yeah, the, the Command and General Staff School, students, and that's the one course probably most people think of when they think of the college and the Command and General Staff College here at Leavenworth, but it's actually just one of the four schools. But those are mid-grade level officers, that is, promotable captains or, or junior majors with about 10 years of service from all branches of the uniformed services, active and reserve components, as well as civilian employees from across various agencies of the U.S. government that have, usually have some mission related to the national security arena of Department of Defense, Department of State, Homeland Security, USAID, etc., and then international officers representing the countries that the government is allowed to come train with us. That's who comprises the course that we're talking about there. The CGSOC Command and General Staff Officer course is what the Command and General Staff Officer School delivers, and it's done in residence here as a graduate level course designed to develop highly competent and professional field grade officers with the war fighting, historical leadership, and decision making expertise that enables them to work with joint and combined formations to successfully execute multi-domain unified land operations across all environments. The course itself and the resident course is about 11 months long, and it has about 1,100 students. They break down with something about 800 or so Army officers, that's both Guard and Reserve as well as active duty, about 80 United States Air Force officers, about 20 Navy officers, 30 Marines. Usually there's one Coast Guard member of the class about 20 of those interagency civilians from across the government, and then about 130 international officers. The course has also provided a distributed learning or a distance learning modality through the total Army school system, as well as through National Guard schools and means, and that has some 5,000 students that are enrolled in various phases of the course all year long. The second school that comprises the college is the School of Advanced Military Studies, or you might hear the acronym SAMS, they're called. They offer two courses the Advanced Military Studies Program, which is an 11-month-long graduate-level course designed to develop effective planners who assist senior leaders to understand the operational environment and then to help them visualize and describe viable solutions for operational problems. The students that are in that course are majors and junior lieutenant colonels who have completed the previously talked about Command and General Staff Officer course. There's about 100 or so of those students that come from all the various services as well as international officers that have taken that course. The second course they offer is the Advanced Strategic Leadership Studies Program, which is a 24-month-long senior level, that is the War College level course. It has about 18 students at the lieutenant colonel and colonel level who have about 18 years or so of service. They also come from all services, the U.S. government agencies and international officers. And the purpose of that course is designed to develop theater-level senior leaders and general staff officers for positions of strategic thinkers and planners at combatant commands, joint task forces, and other four-star level headquarters. Additionally, into the courses that they offer, SAMS also oversees the Advanced Strategic Planning and Policy Program, which is a multi-year program that prepares field grade officers for service as strategic planners through a combination of practical experience, professional military education, and a doctoral curriculum at a civilian university. So they oversee folks that are out in the main community at various universities getting their PhDs. The third school of the college is called the School of Command Preparation, and they conduct several resident Army strategic education program courses to include the pre-command course, the command sergeant's major course, and the command team spouse course. And they synchronize as well the Army's command team preparation programs in order to provide our various formations with competent, committed leaders of character that are prepared to lead and win in the, in the strategic challenges of the 21st century. All these courses range from one to four weeks long, and they're for lieutenant colonels and colonels and command sergeants majors or master sergeant promotable and, and their spouses who've been selected for brigade and battalion command. The fourth of the schools that belong to the college is the Sergeant's Major Academy, which is actually not located here at Fort Leavenworth. It's located down at Fort Bliss in Texas. And it provides a 10-month resident course to about 700 senior non-commissioned officers who are both U.S. and international and has a distributed learning course that has about 1,300 non-commissioned officers enrolled around the world. The course is designed to provide the Army with adaptive senior leaders 
of character, competence, and commitment, and who that can be effective leaders and partners grounded in joint and army doctrine. Sergeant Major Academy offers a bachelor's degree in leadership and workforce development. So that's kind of a lot, but that's a lot of what the Command General Staff College represents to those four schools. And that's why you may hear Fort Leavenworth, the Command General Staff College for two, is the intellectual center of the Army, in addition to the other things that happen here on post with the various trade off, the training and doctorate command organizations. But the school's a big part of that educational development for soldiers of all career levels, as you heard. Well, I'm glad you took the time to walk through that because I don't think people realize how much actually goes on in that location as well as, as you mentioned, at other locations in, around the country. And I've always been surprised, but probably shouldn't be, but I've been surprised at the number of international students that you have that come through the college as well. And I assume it's always been that way. It, it's an important part of the education. As you might imagine, we have the world's finest army. We have the world's finest schooling and professional military education. And certainly our international partners would like to come and train with us. So not only do they get to come and train with the world's finest military and, and spend education time here, but we also, our students, U.S. officers, benefit because those are, in fact, the best officers from around the world. And they come here and obviously they enrich the educational experience in the classroom. And one bonus to that, too, is many of them are able to bring their families with them. And so it's a not only a great professional educational experience as far as military officers go, it's a wonderful opportunity for both the U.S. and our international friends to bring their families and to learn about America. We learn about their cultures. And that's a big part of the education. And it makes for lifelong friendships. I'm sure that's true. They're, they're formed together that oftentimes play themselves out downrange, both from a national security perspective, but also, you know, it helps when folks from around the world learn to see how we do this unique experiment in democracy and how the world's finest military works under civilian control and how we function in democracy. And those lessons have been exported across the world, as well as we take the good things that we learn from our international partners. So it's just a wonderful, enriching part of the programs. That yeah, sounds like it. Rod, are you familiar with our training with industry program that we do at Armed Forces Bank or with the Department of the Army? I'm a, a little bit. We are familiar yeah. with the Army's program. That's wonderful. And thank you all for being part of that. It's not only a great way for the Army to demonstrate the talents that we have that's out there that can contribute to companies like yours are willing, but it also allows for folks, you know, life after, right. whether you spend four years or you spend 30 plus years in, it's a terminal career for all of us. And certainly the men and women that serve are, are wonderfully talented folks. And it's always a win for every community when they, you know, go to work at a fine institution like your all's or anywhere out there. And they, you know, we love to keep them here in the Leavenworth community, greater Kansas city area. You know, Jody's a perfect example, I would say, of that. So her and her family staying here as a military spouse. We love the fact that she's here. And that's just the added benefits. And so I've said, thank, thank, thank you for participating in that program and, and allowing us to not only showcase the talent, but then the opportunities to provide it for folks after service. Agreed. And I know that we've got a couple of graduates that have from the, our program that have attended CGSC from a school standpoint. We have another graduate that's starting next year. And 2023 curriculum that's coming out. So it's going to be interesting and exciting to see the alignment between our two organizations, too. And I would note that while we often talk about and focus on the students that are here in residence, and certainly that's important, as I mentioned, there's, you know, there's thousands of students that, that serve in our reserve component forces. And so they might be part time soldiers, but those men and women are taking the same curriculum, undergoing the same professional military education but they're also holding jobs out in the community. So there may well be employees with you all that are at the bank that are members of the Guard Reserve Forces that are also alumni and students of, of the college. And so that's just wonderful. I'm going to do a little bit of a tangential thing. He is, does this. Is that okay, Jody? <laughs> I can't even say no. I want, to ask, I, want to, <laughs> I want to ask Laura a question. So you participated in a reading program a couple of years ago, and I think it was through – Carl, which is Combined Arms Research Library, and the Community Reads Program, too. And can you tell us a little bit about that, too? And you you can even reference the fact that you read some book called Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. Is that right, too? <laughs> That's did. a great book. I've never read Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. It was Chicka Chicka One, Two, Three. So, yeah. 
The Combined Armed Research Library is our library here on post for the soldiers, but it's also our community library for the families. And the reading program that I participated in was a product of COVID. It was a way to get the kids involved because they couldn't come to the library. So they sat us down, we read a book, and then they recorded it and posted it to their social media page in order to keep the kids involved. But the foundation, we actually support so all the reading programs for the library, for the families. We've been doing that for several years. We do their summer reading programs. They have story walks, which also is a product of COVID. What they do is they deconstruct a book and put it along a pathway so people could read a book and get some exercise outdoors. So that has oh, that's awesome. uh, been a good thing. They also do the holiday reading programs where they'll, you know, do a theme, a holiday theme, and then arts and crafts along with the book. And the foundation supports those things. We also have a Lego room that we supported, you know, for the tactical learning and then for the kids at the library to have another thing to do there. So... That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing all that. And, you know, it's it, a day doesn't go by that I don't get an email from the foundation or some event coming up, whether it was recently, Rod, when we did the Frontier Freedom 5K and you were at the Kansas Speedway on Friday. You've got, you had, I think coming up too, you've got something with Reese Across America. So you're just very, very active out there. Thank you, Laura, for your you. support, participation, especially from the kids' standpoint. Education is important. And I appreciate the outreach that CGSC Foundation does on a really r- regular basis. There's always something happening there. Yeah, I love that it's it's close enough to where we are here in Kansas City. I, you know, I live in Topeka, so it's it's generally close there as well. But it's a way for people to get involved with a military community that may not otherwise be near one. And there are a plethora of opportunities to do plethora. that. Plethora. Plethora. Mm-hmm. The word of the podcast. Word of the day. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I want to jump back to the college just a little bit, Rod. It was very helpful to understand that there are actually four different programs going on within the school. How do people get selected for any one of those? You know, we don't have to get too incredibly detailed, but is that something where they're they're nominated? They are self promoted? How does that how does that work? How do people get to experience? Yeah, all the students that that attend the various courses in the college that we talked about. They're all selected on a competitive basis that's kind of in alignment with their demonstrated duty performance and their potential for higher levels of responsibilities. So they're not voluntary schools necessarily. I say that because there are, there are times, particularly for our reserve component officers, where they can voluntarily, based off of their career pattern and their outside job or their normal civilian job, they might have the opportunity when they can present, desire to participate. But they are selected for the school to attend as well. So, yeah, that's that's the main thing is is, is to understand is these these are the best of the best folks. They're selected for this, as you might imagine. It's, it's our tax dollars fund all this schooling and education. But the Army, in particular, the Defense Department spends uh, very much is invested in the fact that for professional military education is a critical part of leader development. And so, in addition to the experience and training that that soldiers get from their operational jobs and actually doing their, their work at certain times of their career, they're, they are afforded the opportunity to be selected for school. And it is an important step for all the officers at about, like I said, about that eight to 10 years in service to be selected for the command general staff college, because that's a requirement for them to be able to complete that course, that military level of education for in order for them to be, I think, competitive for promotion to Lieutenant Colonel and beyond. They would need to have that schooling credential. So it is important, and it is highly competitive, as you might imagine. Yeah, I imagine it's quite the, quite the honor. I mean, it's not voluntary, but I think it would be fairly prestigious feeling to be selected to attend. And so I will say that in addition to that, coupled with this, is, is we don't want to overlook the fact that this is all buttressed by a world-class faculty. Faculty are a combination of both military and civilian people. They all have education credentials and or practical credentials along with instructor certifications and qualifying to be to teach the course materials. And so sometimes we forget that, you know, that maybe one or two of the foremost experts in the world on, say, North Korea or the Ukraine or defense policy programming or budgeting and, and logistics might very well be sitting right up here on the faculty at the Command General Staff College either as a civilian or as a military person 
and we have uh, because the schools for the most part are done at the master's degree grading level they are certified by the same higher learning commission that uh, that accredits the university of missouri university of kansas this area of the country in addition to the army's certification and the chairman of the joint chief certification so these schools here all have three levels of accreditation and certification to present the curriculum and have qualified faculty so we have faculty with terminal degrees of all various sorts, as well as decades of experience, not only in teaching what, what they're talking about in the classroom. So you don't want to overlook the fact that you've got this world-class faculty that the students are able to draw on as they conduct an adult learning model in these various courses, because that's another important part that goes kind of back to your comment about having the, the, the richness of having the international officers at seminar. With right. They teach at the small group level for the most part. So 15 to 18 students or so with a faculty of anywhere from four to eight faculty assigned. So that's a really small ratio of student to teacher, as well as you have subject matter experts that come in and the students are are required to be part of their own learning. So the students all have that 10 years or plus of experience and they're required to bring that into the classroom and, and add that to the professional discourse and discussion that helps educate their, their classmates. And so there's a, there's a, on purpose design to how the classrooms are set up, the seminars, the staff groups, the learning groups of folks. And so they're all they're all part of this development. And so that's one thing that's maybe a little bit unique from, say, a civilian university. Students are not just students. They're not just there to, to be fed the information or to learn. They are required to be active participants in the learning process, not only for themselves, but also for their classmates, as well as in informing the curriculum and the faculty as they stay current with things there. So that all goes part to making this, you know, the world's finest staff school that there is, because they're certainly part of it. I would say that unlike at a normal university, the college is not necessarily open to the public, but it is because it's not necessarily conducted at any type of secret levels, but it's a matter of being access to the post and then coming into the school. And so normally you just can't drive up and visit like you might drive over to you know, the MU or the KU campus and just wander around. But that's kind of what the foundation is able to do. We enjoy a unique relationship with the college as part of their outreach mission. So we can accommodate visitors and and, and have programs that allow folks to come up and see the college and see what your tax dollars are are doing and watch the, the wonderful things that happen here as we tell part of the college stories. I will note that the Lewis and Clark facility, which is where we're sitting today as we do this broadcast, is the home of the Commander General Staff College, and it is a state-of-the-art modern learning facility like you would see at any university across the country now. And while at the same time, it is a, has a museum-like quality about it that pays homage and to the history and heritage of our Army. So it hosts several displays of things throughout the building, as well as it also hosts two halls of fame, the International Hall of Fame, which is a hall of fame that highlights the international students that have completed the coursework here and have gone on to be to at least to the level of senior chiefs of service and higher. We have, I think it's eight or nine heads, former heads of state, something that I don't know if any civilian university could boast, but as alumni here, heads of state, as well as then the Fort Leavenworth Hall of Fame, which means someone's had to have served here and then has done something unique and distinct on the impact on our army or our country. We recognize the whole thing. So those are all here, part of the building. It's all part of the magistry of getting educated in this building. And it's a wonderful opportunity that the foundation would love to have folks come up and, and visit. And we can certainly arrange for those type of things, as I said, as part of our mission in supporting and helping the school tell its story and connecting with the public. Yeah, I would definitely encourage people to do that. I've had the pleasure of being on such a visit that you helped arrange and you're right. The facilities are impressive. I think I have a picture of myself sitting behind, I want to say General Patton's desk, yes. which, you know, I looked very important <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> this is the yeah. first time for everything, yes, isn't there? Yes, yes. Yeah. At least I felt very important. I might not have looked very important, but it was an impressive facility. We got to participate in a simulation that was that was run for us and, and part of my team. And I may or may not have done very well in the simulation, but we did <laughs> get to participate. You have the opportunity, if you visit, you can sit at the, we have some furniture from uh, General MacArthur's last office. That's right. And so you can sit behind General MacArthur's desk and have your picture taken. But as you mentioned, uh, one of the things that the building does pay homage to the 
five five-star generals of the Army. So there's an the largest auditorium in the state of Kansas is the Eisenhower Auditorium. It seats 2,004 people permanently, and it can have additional seats added as we need. It's just a wonderful state-of-the-art facility that, like I said, we've had everything from the ballet or acting companies or soldier shows come in for family-type activities to having the entire class of the 1,500 students of CGSOC and SAMS in there in a video teleconference with the commander out of Afghanistan and Iraq talking about what's going on on the ground. So a wide variety of things there that are available. Once again, a state-of-the-art facility, magnificent learning environment, and it be fitting, however, of the level of students and the serious people that are in the course. Yeah, that new school on, on post two, Rod, the General Patton School that opened this, this is the first year for that too, that state-of-the-art facility, state-of-the-art technology. And that's just, whenever I think of Fort Leavenworth, think of CGSC, think of the schools on post that it's always, it's always top-notch and it's always people feeling proud that they're associated with the fort. So that thank you for making that happen. Sure. And, and I will note that, that that's a little different than the Commander General Staff College. We're privileged to have kind of a holdover of old Kansas law. The fort does have its own unified school district. And we have a junior high, which is the Patton Junior High you talked about, and they just moved into a brand new building this year, as you mentioned. And then we have three grade schools. And what those, the purpose of those schools are, they're designed to the 800 or so families that live here on post, kind of like the Carl Library you mentioned a while ago. In addition to being the graduate degree level of library that supports the college work, it's also our community library for our families and children that live here. Those are those schools. So folks that live on post and those that work on post have the opportunity to have their kids come to one of the three grade schools or the junior high school here on post. And yeah, it's a great activity. It is overseen by the, the, the general who's here, who's got a school board, and we have a wonderful opportunity. And once again, just staffed by many folks that are professional Department of Defense teachers or spouses. And we benefit rotate in, but then we also have a professional teaching corps that, that take care of our kids. Another part of the Fort Leavenworth community, great, for greater Fort Leavenworth community, that the foundation also participates in is in that soldier and family support area. So, Rod, tell us a little bit and tell our audience, how does somebody go about donating funds to the foundation and supporting the foundation? It could be volunteer work, too. But typically there are three general areas, right? There's scholarship, there's outreach, and then there's soldier and family. And you want to break it down a little bit more in detail, but but give direction to the audience about how to support the foundation? Sure. Well, thank you for that opportunity. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we are a 501c3, completely donor-funded. And so the work that we're able to do is is all enabled by the wonderful support of folks who have an appreciation and understanding for the impact that the foundation can do in the development of the leaders here that, that participate through the college. You can certainly make donations right at our website. You mentioned that, I think, maybe earlier, but, you know, www.cgscfoundation.org. We'd love to have you go there. Look at the programs that, are, that we support and conduct, both for the community and in support of the college, and we'd love to have you join there. I will say that one of the reasons why the foundation was, was stood up was because there was this recognized need to do some things that would make the education system here is just a little bit better. Our tax dollars provide for uh, things that are all here. And it's, a, like I said, the best school in the world, producing the world's finest military leaders. But there are some things that can be done a little bit more. There's only so much dollars for curriculum, so much dollars for speakers, so much dollars for family-type activities, so much money for telling the story and connecting folks with it. And that's what the foundation was created for. And so that's what donations would be do would be supporting those type of areas. And I also will last note that while it might be great that you want to just think this is wonderful going on here and you want to support it, it's pretty hard for an individual to just give money to the Army or to the college. Right. Right. You know, there's ethics regulations involved and there's and there processes about how you can do that. So that's one of the things that the foundation enables folks to do. You can give money to the foundation and you can direct us how you might specifically like that to be done, say for a specific thing like scholarships for military families, or you might just say, no, I love the fact you're bringing speakers into the school that's over and above the curriculum, like, hey, that was wonderful. You brought in the National Security Advisor to talk to the school. We'd like for you to do that, and so we'll just take that money and do there. So you can make uh, donations either to specific programs or to general programs or whatever. The three areas that you mentioned about are 
scholarship. And as I mentioned, that's enhancing the academic experience. We do that through a series of programs and activities, such as speaker series, like the Powell Lecture Series, where we bring in folks of international prominence to discuss national security issues with the class. The Shelton Visiting Professor of Ethics, where we bring in a civilian academic ethicist to assist in, in overseeing and, and working with military ethics programs and discussions. We bring in, with the uh, partnership of DACOR out of Washington, D.C., a visiting professor of diplomacy, where we bring in ambassadors to discuss country team and other parts of government operations directly impacting and diplomacy on the side of national security. We sponsor academic research and publications by both faculty and students. We fund travel. We publish things. We encourage students and faculties to add to the professional discourse. And then lastly, probably in this area, we, we sponsor and recognize excellence. That's the graduation awards for the top students and the best faculty. In the area of outreach, which is connecting the general population with their military and their college, we provide opportunities for folks to come up and see what their tax dollars are paying for, and just like we talked about a while ago. You get, they can get an appreciation for the level of the expertise of the CGSC faculty and an appreciation for the graduate level study of serious issues by very serious people. The foundation, in partnership with the college, conducts events such as our National Security Roundtable, the VIP visits, the Harder Role in National Security Forum, and other leader development programs that allow for interaction and participation between students, faculty, and community and public leaders. We also have a CGSC Foundation Alumni Association program, which for allows for graduates to maintain professional contact like any other civilian university would do. We encourage all graduates of any of the college's schools to join the Alumni Association, not only to enjoy the professional connection that that'll yield, but also to take advantage of the many opportunities that we provide for our members. That's things like scholarships for family members, discounts in our gift shops, special invitations to events, partner-related activities and benefits, and those type of things. The last area that you mentioned that we provide our support in is that soldier and family support, which is really all about enriching the lives of our military families for both the service member and their family. Jo as Jody knows, military families are unique in many ways, but we're also just like many civilian military families in a lot of ways. The foundation funds Support to children and family reading programs, like you talked about with Laura a while ago at, the li at our library here. Mm -hmm. um, they not only support the college and academia, but they are our public library. And it's important for our kids to have benefits of, of you know, reading programs, participate in the Dr. Seuss Day, dress like a pirate activities. And we fund all those type of things. But uh, once again, if the Army wouldn't necessarily have set aside money to do that, that's what we do. We provide scholarships that I mentioned a couple times to military families. We provide funds to support the sponsorship programs of the international officers and their families when they come here. We supported the International Family Fishing Derby, which was a great opportunity here in September where our international friends and their families were able to do a family-focused activity on the classic American pastime of, you know, fishing for fun with your family. It's a great thing. You mentioned that we just did the 5K family run, a wonderful opportunity where we had 100 folks or so come out and and see the beauty of the post. The idea was to bring folks from the Kansas City area to come down and see the beauty here, but then also to provide an activity where we had soldiers and their families with strollers and their dogs and participating in the run and just a great family activity. With the Frontier Army Museum supporting us, we opened up on a Sunday, special opportunity to visit the museum there. And we had the bucket list of opportunities just this last Friday at the Kansas Speedway. One of my trustees, President Speedway allowed us to use that venue for a bucket list opportunity where we had a little social down in the Victory Lane area, a place that's usually not accessible by the public. But then you got the opportunity to drive your car around the Speedway track or to ride in the official NASCAR pace car around uh -huh. the track. And it was just a wonderful, fun activity. I think it'd be safer to ride, not drive. Yeah. Is that, <laughs> Rod, was that, was that the first time you had done something with the Speedway for the foundation? No, actually, we did. We did an event similar to that last spring when the last year's class was here. A uh, great activity. And like I said, we've got the wonderful support of the Kansas Speedway. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just another opportunity so that when you look back in your military career and say, wow, you know, that, that, that one year I was at Fort Leavenworth. I got to do this bucket list opportunity, bucket list opportunity to drive my car around the NASCAR Speedway track. Just another memorable activity. Just another way for us to say thank you 
in our appreciation for the service and, and sacrifice that our military families do. That's the type of activities that we do in, in that area. So, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to, to, to elaborate on those, because those are really the heart of what the reason why the foundation exists. We, we want to enhance that professional military education experience, and that includes telling the story, but also making sure that we don't we take the time to honor our families that are right there in tow with our students. I think about, you know, when, you know, you know, Tina Farr, Rod, you met, you met with her, worked with her a little bit. She's a um, supporter in our community. It, she's a great brand ambassador for us. And I, when I think about hiring someone like that, I always think of hiring the mayor of Fort Leavenworth and she needs to be involved with MWR and AFES and the commissary and the foundation and every activity that goes on. And, and October is a big month and trunk or treats right around the corner. You think about all the things that we're doing to support, just like you do for soldier and family that there's, they're interwoven in the activities that you do. So thanks for talking about upcoming events and, to wrap up here, is there any upcoming event that you want to share that's either on the horizon the rest of this year or early into next year? Well, I, I will take a moment to just thank Armed Forces Bank. You all have been an instrumental supporter from the start of our foundation. And so thank you. We thank you very much for that. Your not only your financial support has enabled to do these programs and Armed Forces Bank has been a wonderful part of there, but you've also provided volunteers and participated in activities. We couldn't have done it without you and folks that are like you. So we very much appreciate that. And even with Jody and her previous companies that she was president for, wonderful help with the support of military families and and the work that the foundation did. And and I know that when I first came on board, that my first time of meeting Jody, her company made a direct cash contribution to the FMWR folks, and the foundation was able to facilitate that in time for Christmas some Christmas needs that were met, needed um, that existed there. So just a wonderful opportunity for a better. And, and I thank Armed Forces Bank for doing folks like things like this, as well as the continued support you do for us. Rod, I, Rod, I thought I was personally responsible for Jody's philanthropy, <laughs> but apparently she had it before she joined our company. So <laughs> You're responsible we're, for so much more. <laughs> we're, just, we're glad to have her here. I'll tell you that. All the good things, Tom. <laughs> All the good things. Well, it's been just an absolute pleasure to have you and Laura both on today. If you can hang with us for just another couple of seconds here, we have this quirky little fun thing we like to do each podcast called the Military Minute. So you can listen, but you can't give the answer because you might know it, but our audience hopefully will have to do a little work on it. So last (laughs) week's Military Minute was a question regarding the military wallet. And the question that we asked was, how many types of thrift savings contributions are there? So we Say that real fast. Say thrift savings contributions. I can't. I haven't had enough coffee to say that really fast. So the three types. The the answer is there are three types. So that was the answer. Three. Three. Yes, just three. But I will give you more than just the answer. There is a defined contribution plan, a tax-deferred retirement plan, and an annual contribution limits. So hopefully some smart audience member commented that on our social media (laughs) and stay tuned uh, to have the winner announced. Just be patient. I'm sorry. Uh, This week, I've had too much coffee. I haven't. (laughs) This week's Military Minute topic is, of course, a question on CGSE. And you're going to have to do a little digging because I don't think this came up on on the conversation today. So get your research hats on. What year was the inception of the School of Applications for Infantry and Cavalry born? Do we need to say that one more time for the audience? Probably. Yeah. What year was the inception? You can't answer, Rod. Put your hand down. down. Yeah. (laughs) Turn off your your monitor. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So if you don't know the answer, call Rod is what I just figured out. What year was the inception of the School of Applications for Infantry and Cavalry Born? So watch for our Facebook post and Instagram post to drop this week's podcast and comment with your answer for a chance to win $50 for you. And maybe more importantly, $50 for a charity of your choice. You might choose to donate that back to CGSC Foundation. We heard today that you can do that at www.cgscfoundation.org. You can go there and donate. You can, uh uh-oh, Rod's got his hand up. You really can't answer the question. (laughs) I I wondered if you would allow me a closing closing statement. Yes, absolutely. Sure. Thanks again for mentioning our website. Um, That's what I was going to do. But I just want to just remind folks that the Command General Staff College Foundation is a completely donor-funded foundation and supports all as needed and welcome. 
We are a 501c3, so donations are tax deductible. And while there's lots of worthy charities out there to include charities in support of our military and veterans, the Command General Staff College Foundation offers you the opportunity to contribute to the professional development of our future national security leadership. Donations made to our foundation really do make a difference. Programs and activities that we provide offer a margin of excellence to the CGSC curriculum and contribute to the excellence that we want our future leaders to have. I invite everyone out there to become a part of something that really does matter and makes a difference. Thank you very much for allowing us the opportunity to talk about our foundation on your podcast. It was a pleasure to have you. Yes, and I thought I knew everything I knew about CGSC and the foundation, but I learned a plethora of information <laughs> from, that word again. from them. So thank you. And if you enjoyed today's episode, go to afbank.com and subscribe to the show. Also, make sure you rate us, leave us a comment, hopefully favorably for Tom and Another comment for Jody (laughs) on your favorite podcast platforms such as Apple Podcasts or Spotify and YouTube. We're we're on YouTube now, aren't we? We have 15 episodes out there, Rod. You're Insta famous, Tom. So yeah, that you're the 16th episode coming out, and we're looking forward to sharing all the great information you shared and you and Laura when it comes to uh, what you're doing, all the good work you're doing in the community. So thank you very much, Rod. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Got it. Bye. Copyright 2022 Armed Forces Bank, member FDIC, equal housing lender. All non-Armed Forces Bank owned apps, websites, company names, and product names are trademarks or registered trademarks of their respective owners. Their mention does not imply any affiliation with or endorsement by Armed Forces Bank of them or their products and services. They are merely used as examples of the many available apps, companies, and websites that offer similar services. Before using any app or website, you should carefully review the terms of use, data collection, and privacy policy. Apps may have an initial cost or in-application purchase features. This information is general in nature and is not intended to be legal, tax, or financial advice. Although Armed Forces Bank believes this information to be accurate, it cannot ensure that it could change. Statements or opinions of individuals referenced herein are their own, not Armed Forces Bank. Consult an appropriate professional concerning your specific situation and respective governing bodies for applicable laws, such as IRS.gov for current tax law, Armed Forces Bank, the Armed Forces Bank logo, and the militarily speaking logo are registered trademarks of Armed Forces Bank.